Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Gagno Atelier. I'm your old pal, Tim Gagno, and this is the Modern Masters Podcast. Well, welcome to the show, everybody. I'm so excited that you're here. We have got a fabulous show for you. I am so excited. Oh, my gosh. I got to be honest. I'm geeking out a little bit. I'm geeking out bad. And I hope that you will be. You're going to be geeking out, too, once you hear from our guest and all of the things that he has done in his career. But uh, before we do that, guys, if you could do something for me, if you can look below here and uh, see that we would love for you to like and share uh, the Gagno Atelier Facebook page, if you could do that for us, or if you could go on over to our channel on YouTube, the Gagno Atelier YouTube channel, and hit the subscribe button uh, and also the notification bell, that would be very much appreciated. We are trying to grow our YouTube channel uh, as we speak. The more people we can reach there, the better. Uh, One of the great things about our YouTube channel is that every single episode of the Modern Masters podcast has been archived over there. So you can watch every single artist we have ever interviewed just go on over to Gagno Atelier YouTube channel. You can check that out. We also have a bunch of tutorial videos. We have some illuminated Messiah videos uh, that are great. I think you're going to love those. And I know you're going to love those because they're just awesome. And uh, we also have got some videos like product reviews, all kinds of different things like that. So uh, check it out. I think you guys will really like it. And as always, we want to thank our sponsor for the show, Edge Digital Agency. Uh, they are my friends that did all of the uh, graphics that you just saw, the Gagno Atelier uh, open and uh, the Modern Masters little intro that we've got. Uh, They created those for us. And guess what? They can create it for you too. So when you get a chance, go check them out at edgedigital.agency and uh, they can help you with all of your digital media needs. All right, guys. Well, with all of that said, let me bring on my guest, now, you guys are going to love him. Uh, his name is Frank Ordez, and he is one of the coolest artists you are ever going to meet. And so with that said, here he comes on the show. Welcome, sir, to the show. Well, glad to be on, Tim. I'm, I feel privileged, honored, excited. Oh, my goodness. I'm feeling all, like a all, 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 yeah. all those adjectives. <laughs> this is too much fun. I had a... I had a long day of painting. Uh, I, my wife is upset at me because I, I wanted to have an early dinner. And so she made you know, some salmon for me and she's all upset because I, I, I forced her to, uh, to make something so, so quickly that, you know, she didn't quite cook it right. But uh, I have to apologize to her, her when I come home. But I did this for you, Tim. Did it oh, all for you. Well, I appreciate it. Now I'm jealous because you got you're getting salmon for dinner. So oh, good. Damn. Some garlic. Oh, and garlic? Stop it. <laughs> now I'm hungry. <laughs> I, had ta- I had a hamburger. I had a hamburger. Salmon. Oh, man. Uh, hey, is- I would love to have a hamburger. My wife is one of these. Uh, she's not a vegan type, but she's a health food nut. She's uh-huh. she, she actually has celiac disease, so we're definitely gluten-free family. And so there's once in a while where I, I'm, I'm jonesing for a burger and I'm jonesing for pizza. And she just guilts me. She goes, let you, have you, it. you know it's not good for you. You know, oh, it's going to kill you. It's so good and so yummy, you know? <laughs> so I'll sneak away. I'll sneak away and get a burger. You just got to sneak away and have a burger. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I'm with you. Sometimes I'm like, how am I going to get her to let me have a pizza? Well, you know. So we, <laughs> well, it's so good. Yeah, I know. They're so good. But, you know, it's like this one thing I do know. There's science behind this that has been proven that married men live longer, healthier lives than single men do, and that's because we have wives that stop us. <laughs> that or our wives are slowly killing us, slowly. Maybe you know, right. a little, <laughs> little bit of, at a time. Oh, no, I've been God. married. I've been married for about thirty-three years now. Oh, I'm gonna get in trouble here. You know, after thirty, it's it's a blur. It's a blur. You're just happy to yeah. be there at that point. Yes, thank you. There you go. <laughs> I always say to people when they see me, I'm like, you want to see a magic trick? And they're like, they're like, okay. And I'm saying, what? I'm going to make myself better looking. And they're like, what? I'm saying, watch, I'm going to make myself better looking. And then what I do is I go like this. My wife's sitting over here and I'll be like, I get a little closer to her and say, 
Ta-da, I am suddenly better looking. There you go. <laughs> That's I, gotta, good, I gotta steal that move. Yeah, it's a good move. It's a good move. It definitely gets you out of the doghouse anytime. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, I, I'm, I, I, you came. Uh, uh, we have a mutual friend, uh, Melanie Bogle, who told me, Tim, you have got to get Frank on the show. Um, she, I think, she took one of your workshops, and uh, she just fell in love with you. And she was right. telling me all about you. And she was like, "Oh, you two are like two peas in a pod. You're going to get along great. You've got to have him on your show." So. Yeah. I tracked you down and here we are. And I am really amped. I checked out your website, um, you know, and I was really blown away by what I saw. You, you know, I. Well, you're too kind. I, well, you know, it, it's, it's, you got it. Sometimes you got to treat people like a, like a piece of toast and butter them up a little bit. <laughs> but, um, you know, you got to use was, extra oh, butter for me. There you go. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I call the show Modern Masters and I try to bring on actual master artists, you know, and that's not a name that they, I'll say this way. That's a name that I find is thrown around a little too casually. Right. And so um, I, I try to be careful with the name of the show, Modern Masters, by bringing on what I consider to be master artists. And uh, you, you definitely fit that bill uh, with your career and, and the things that you've done, your skill level and things like that. And so um, I really think that, that the viewers are going to absolutely love it. Guys, as you're watching, uh, get out your notepads and uh, take some notes. And as That's always, right. there is going to be a test. Well, there might be a test, too. But, you know, I really it's amazing the, the, the nuggets that come out of these shows where it's like, wow, I, no one ever said that. To me. I've never heard that before. Or yeah. um, I to me, it's like I have learned more from just interviewing all, all these artists on this show. Um, we've so had about 30 episodes in and I'm like, yeah, sometimes I think, yeah, that is why I do it yeah. because it's so much fun. We have well, a blast. I, well, I tell my students, if you can, if you can take a workshop and remember one or two things, significant two yeah. things, then it makes all the difference. Cause sometimes you're, uh, a student isn't ready for, for new knowledge, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'll need a teacher who will have expertise or at least is very focused in an area that you need to develop. Now, I, I always appreciated golfers because even the best golfers will go, you know, I'm not too good at my short game. So I'm going to have somebody look at my short game, my, uh, you know, when I tee off, look at, look at my posture. I mean, there's all these things that we need. I happen to be very lucky to hear in my town, there's a, there's a animation director from Disney. I have a friend who's an architect with a really good eye. So these people come in and they'll critique my work. And that's something I, I learned when I was at Lucasfilm. We would spend an hour, sometimes an hour and a half, every day looking at our paintings, just sitting down and critiquing them. Now, it took a while. Uh, I, I got an art center, so we learned about critiques. But it's usually a critique from a teacher for about 10 minutes, maybe, mm -hmm. max, then on to the next student. Right. But we're talking an hour and a half sometimes looking at a pain. How can we make this better? And so if you do have that esprit de corps where you're all thinking, how can I make this shot have major production value? Then you're always, you're, you're not stuck and you, you don't fall in love with your work. And that was a big takeaway. Do not fall in love with your work. You're always looking at it going to, this area be larger? Could this area be smaller? Is this dominant enough, which is my first read, which is my second read, which is my third read? I believe in reads. I tell my students, when you come into a room, people first see color and shape. And if they like it, they'll come in closer. And then uh, when they're around 10 feet away, they'll see the subject matter. And if they like the subject matter, they'll get closer and then they'll be marveled how it was done. Wow, look at the thickness of this of, of the strokes. My God, there's it's just like chicken scratch. That's amazing. You stand back, it looks real. And so there's all these different levels of appreciation that I that I tell that I tell students. And you're and some people are, are ready to hear that and some are not. And I and I think some of the best teachers are older farts like me who've done done it all, so to speak. And, and, and almost have a grandfatherly attitude in how to talk to a student and how to bring them along and how to nurture them. 
And because I've, I've, I've talked to people who've taken classes from very accomplished younger artists. When I say younger artists, I'll say maybe 30s and 40s. Mm -hmm. and, they'll, and they'll get mad when somebody asks them, oh, what, what colors did you, did you mix to get that? And the artist will say, hey, you know, don't bother me right now. I've actually heard that. You know, it, oh, wow. it, it, yeah, it doesn't matter what I mix. Just pay attention how the colors go together. And I usually will be a little bit more because you figure that people are usually for some of these workshops for a whole weekend, 400, 500, 600 bucks. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you, so you, so you want to know, you know, why did you do what you do? Why right. uh, was there, was there, it, you know, the big word right now is an intentionality to be right. Have you heard right. that Tim? Intentional. Yeah. Be intentional. Well, I've, I've known that in art, like forever, there's there should be a reason why you put that color next to this other color, next to another color, looking at your negative shape, why your negative shapes are the way they are versus your positive shapes. Right. Art is actually extremely sophisticated. When, if you really want to be accomplished and master your craft, you're really looking at all the different facets, whether it's color, composition, texture, edges, narrative, storytelling. How are you going to frame it? How are you going to stage it? It can be overwhelming. And but eventually when you when you create your own style, you your work will be recognizable. And and right. I, I, I just like guitarists, any major guitarist has accomplished with their with their instrument, right? But they all have a certain sound. You can yes. you can you you can you you can hear a guitar you go that's Jimi Hendrix. You can hear another guitar you go that's BB King. You can hear another guitar that's Carlos Santana. You know right. what I'm saying? Right. They have they have their own artistic voice. Right, and that voice takes a while to uh, develop. To develop because you have all these different influences. There's mm -hmm. some people that say you know I'm I'm a self-made artist. Well, you could all that means you probably haven't taken classes at a school. But everybody's got influences because right. you do. You, you live now. We're getting a little bit of philosophy. You you live in a certain time and space. If you lived during the the Renaissance, okay, then the new thing then was perspective. So that was the rage. That and, and chiaroscuro, right? That, that dramatic, like a stage, the dark background, the light foreground. All these things are very important. And and, and you move through the history of art. And there are more things that are added to the lexicon of art, to the vocabulary, to these these these, these brushes that artists can use to create artwork. And uh, it's it, it's a wonderful heritage, I believe, to be an artist, because we do stand on the shoulders of all these other great. Uh, let me turn down my phone. All these great men who came before us and great women, and. Um, you build, we build on that, right? Right. And I like what Delacroix said, you know, even with the simple things, there's still more to say. And I've always thought that that was a great statement. You know, good example is mother and child. You know, mother and child was a certain way during the 1500s. A mother and child now, consider how our culture is so different, right? In oh, yeah. this country, just how that's painted. It's not, it's not going to look like a Renaissance Mary and Jesus, right? Right. So there's all these more these different elements in how we look at at the world, and art, in my belief system, is a gift from God, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's it's my desire to develop that gift. And so my art teacher also gave me an, an, a nice little aphorism, and that was faith in God, confidence in the in your abilities. And, and what he meant by this, the ability that God gave you, faith in God confidence in your ability. Because right. my, my buddy, Matt, uh, Matt Tommy from Thriving Christian Artists, uh, he likes to say you need to be filled and skilled. Yeah. Filled with the spirit of God and skilled so that you can yeah. actually do what your spirit is telling you you want to paint. Yeah. Now I've worked with a group called Masterpiece Christian mm -hmm. uh, led by Jeannie Randall. And, um, you know, part, a part of the, of the emphasis or the things that we we stress for that group is to be excellent, to get yeah. anybody to get anybody's attention. You have to be excellent, and, and excellent in a good way. 
not in a notorious right. way, right? So right. much of what you see on YouTube is very vulgar. You know, uh, Cardi B has, what is it? Was it 90 billion hits or whatever? Right, right, right. But it's vulgar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you are going to get attention. Right, right. right. And that's the thing. You know, and, and nowadays in the art world, one of the things that you're seeing is you're, you're seeing um, a lot of the younger artists. Uh, and there's actually a cartoon that shows that you have um, you have these people um, where they will. It's the whole sex sells thing. And right. so the way that they grow their their social media presence is they'll they'll have this woman. And it's the artist. She's it's a female artist and she's holding a painting or she's standing next to a painting. But I can guarantee you nobody's looking at the painting because she is wearing very little and she's showing off everything she's got physically yeah. as she's standing next to her painting. Right. And she's got 9 million followers on Instagram. And it's like, okay, is that your artwork that did it? Or is it the cleavage? Yeah. You know? it, so well, like, but there are some that they think that's going to get them the, the hits and the yeah. likes and all this. And they're chasing likes and, and shares and all they're, they're, they're chasing yeah. social media fame. But then you'll see another artist that is, an outrageous talent, uh, just an amazing skill. And you don't even know what they look like because their Instagram is just their artwork right. and they'll have a 10th uh, as that's, followers that's, on social that's, media. That's me. Hmm. Maybe, you know? I should, maybe I should hire, you know, <laughs> hire, a model. With, hire a model. Hire a model. Yeah. That would be like, funny, wouldn't it? Because really, no. This, this is, no. Yeah, yeah. Nobody, nobody see me on, on Instagram. So I can literally... Right. I mean, wouldn't that be funny? Think about it. Yeah. But, you know, but that's the thing, though, is it's like, what are you chasing after? How are you trying? Is it your art or is it this? And you, and you have to be realistic in what you're doing. But social media has become such an interesting way for artists to share what we do. Right. And there are some artists that I know that they do have massive followings on social media. And you wouldn't even know what they look like because it's nothing but their artwork. But their artwork is so good that they've developed a following. Right. just off of that. And, um, but there are some that are doing it in the other way. And, that, and right. that's a shame. And, and there are now memes about it um, where you'll have a cartoon of, of a picture of a girl, you know, the scandally clack girl showing her pictures and it shows that she's got a million followers. And then you see this artist with this beautiful piece of art that's way more skilled. And she's got like six and they're both standing there like, well, why can't, you know, what about me? And it's like, you know, <laughs> it's the world. <laughs> It's the world we live in yeah. today, and, and it's kind of a shame, but that's the world we live in today, and it's it's really wild. You know, well, talk, it, it, talk, it, it, talk, it, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say it's the sin of like. There's so much power. You know, when you're a child, mm -hmm. grammar school, you want people to like you. So there's right. something uh, uh, primal, Jungian, about liking, putting the like there. It's, it's like whoever right. came up with Facebook realized – there is a power in like. Yes, the popularity contest. Yes, and yep. that there is so and so these. Uh, I mean, I've read about it. Uh, my kids came a little after uh, Facebook. What was the the, uh, the one before that? It was MySpace. That was MySpace. Yeah, they were they were when they were at the uh, the forefront of that. But there are there are kids who have committed suicides because they don't have enough likes. Nobody likes them. And they just figure their life is worthless because if they don't have an internet presence, right. then they're nobody. You right. know, there's exactly. that great, there's that great scene in Birdman. Have you ever seen Birdman the movie? I have not yet seen it. I don't okay. know why I haven't seen it. Oh, uh, great movie! Spoiler alert. But there's a scene where uh, Michael Keaton is being uh, harassed, uh, being read the riot act by by his daughter. And she goes, you're not on fate, you know, on Facebook, you're not on Instagram, you're not on social media, you're not on this or that. She goes, you don't exist. You don't matter. You're nobody. And you could just look at his face, and he's like, you know, I, I, I'm nobody as a father because there's a gen, there's a generational conflict there. Right. There's a, there's a cognitive dissonance there that you're you're nothing unless you have likes and significance on the social media all right you know so dare to be different right right well you know and that and that is one of the the, the inherent problems with, with society as it's been 
changed by or evolved from the invention of social media right. is, is, you know, what would most people rather have? Most people would rather have a few small, super strong relationships that are right. lifelong than a million surface friendships. But right. nowadays, everybody wants a million surface friendships because that's what they call right. it on Facebook. We're Facebook friends. You know, you barely know the person or you don't know them at all. But if, if I have a million of that, then I then I arrived as a human being and you have very few real friends. That's not right. healthy, you know, but, you know, it's 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 the world we're in. It's I say it all the time. We are living in the twilight zone. <laughs> it's just a weird, weird, weird I call it, we're living in. And I you call can, it, can have a whole other conversation about that. Yeah, I, I call it the apocalypse. We're in the apocalypse. <laughs> it can definitely feel like it sometimes. Yeah. Well, let's talk about uh, your art. career. Yeah, let's talk about your art career for. Let's make that transition. Yeah. Um, I'm having so much fun already. This is great. <laughs> but let's talk about your career because your career. Um, you started your career, and you mentioned it already. Uh, working for Industrial Light and Magic. Um, that's George were, Lucas's uh, yes, George special Lucas's effects company. Story, Magic Star Wars. Um, you worked as a matte painter. Correct. Okay. And so tell us exactly, first of all, what the heck is a matte painter? What, what does that job do? And I, I'm going to show uh, an image, two, two images of your matte paintings, and then I'm going to show a video clip of that matte painting being used in a movie. And then we'll come back and you can explain to us like how it's done. Like how do you actually make a matte painting? Okay. So first of all, what is a matte painting? Well, it's a background. Okay. It's it's part of what's called post-production. After all the live action has been shot for a, for a film, this was pre, uh, my work was pre-digital. So we worked on film. Uh, post-production, then uh, Industrialized and, and Magic was a special effects company. So we created backgrounds. So if, uh, let's say you had Luke Skywalker, if he's walking on uh, Endor or if he's walking on one of his planets, well, you have to paint the planet. It's It doesn't exist. And right. so the job of the artist, called a matte painter, because you it's like a piece of a puzzle, piece of a mat, uh, they have to create that world and, and you have to make it look very realistic just so that the viewer accepts it as reality. And so those are the hardest map paintings to do because everybody already knows the landscape doesn't exist. So you, it has to be painted in such a way that people accept it as being real. Right. So you're, you're, you need the skills of your imagination, creativity, but you also have to have some good chops in terms of, of traditional painting, light and dark, making something feel solid and right. have aerial perspective. And, and essentially, you want to also direct the eye. We're, if, if, if there's live action in one, let's say, we're in one part of the frame, that's where you want the eye to go. So everything is painted so that the eye just looks at that part of the frame. So one, in one way, if you look at some matte paintings, originals, they were some were done on glass. They're almost three by six feet. Some of them can seem very loosely painted. See, because what was we're painting to the camera, and the camera is essentially um, looking at the light that's being cast off from the surface. So, if you're looking at an area that has a lot of light, that's where the eye is going to go. So, that's where the majority of the painting and detail is going to be. Everything that's not in the light that's uh, off, that's in the shade, well, it's going to be suggested. So, if you actually, if you saw the movie, you go, "Wow, it's real." There's so much detail. And then, if you saw the map painting. It only looks real where the, where the live action is and everything else. Oh, wow. Fairly, it's fairly really? loose because most map, map, map paintings are up on the screen for maybe two to five. Five seconds is the most, absolute most. And if it's on for five seconds, usually there's a pan. It starts close up and it moves back or it'll, it'll come in closer or it, there, there's some motion happening. That's the only reason why it would be on longer than, you know, than a second or two. But normally in map paintings, we're on two seconds, maybe three. 
fairly that's, quick. That's amazing. That's amazing. So what what movies give us some of the movies that you worked on that people would that people would remember? Obviously, you must have worked on Star Wars because you're working on Industrial Light Magic, George Lucas. Yeah. So yeah. What okay. Well, that? I yeah. You know, so so I'm 63. So I I, I worked in the area that was a, a time called the Golden Age of of Lucasfilm, uh, part of the original trilogy. Trilogy. So my first my first painting was the opening scene to E.T. And and then after that, I worked on uh, the Wrath of Khan. Then after Wrath of Khan, I worked on Jedi. Okay, and it was a very small company. Island at that time was a small company. There were, uh, was thousands of employees now. But back then, I think we had about seventy employees. So during the production of that movie, I actually worked on a model. I worked on the Death Star. So oh, cool. I, 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 yeah, I paint. I painted. I painted the skin of the Death Star. I also did some work in in the art department. And uh, was an extra. So, uh, so I did. So uh, uh, we did forty-five uh, matte paintings for uh, Jedi. So I have several uh, in in that in that movie. And then we also did some uh, TV movies. I think we did two uh, uh, Ewok movies. And see a little Ewok right there. Right there. Right there. Uh -huh. did, did several Ewok movies. Then after that, uh, worked on Enemy Mine, uh, Goonies, Back to the Future. Um, I know I miss. I, I, I worked on th uh, three Star Treks, and uh, you worked on Star Wars and Star Trek. Yeah. Oh yeah. my goodness! I yeah. can see the fights on, on the the fan base. <laughs> the yeah. Fan well, base. well, here's the thing. Back then, Industrial Light Magic, we we were the big dog. Well, we had all the technology. Uh, we have green screen uh, now. Back then, we had blue screen, mm -hmm. and. We were the player. So if you were a, a, a movie company and it was a big production, we, we were the company you came to to really give you give you production value. Uh, right. Value plus George had also created uh, a, a sound sound for the movie studios called THX. Mm -hmm. and do you remember that? And so I that do. was that was a big thing. And so they would give you THX sound in your own theater, so you can have our special effects and, and, and the sound that go along to it where the sound would go reverberate and go all around, all around the, the, the right. movie theater. Yeah. So it was a wonderful place to work, uh, to work at. Oh, I also worked at Indiana Jones. So it was also an, an extra, a small little, little bit scene in, in one of the map paintings. So, um, I had a wonderful time. I did, I, I worked there during my twenties. So oh, wow. I, I pinched myself because it was a, uh, it was a great time in my life where I could work just these insane hours and even sleep there at the company and just work the next day because we were, I was so into it. Right. And, and it was just a wonderful time. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. Well, let's show, let's show two matte paintings here. One is from Star Wars. I think this is from Return of the Jedi. It's in the Ewok village. And the other one, the one on the bottom is from Star Trek, The Wrath of Khan. And it will be, um, we're going to put it on the screen here. And that's the uh, that's the Eden Cave from the Genesis Project. That when they were when they were uh, Terra Genesis making their yeah. own planet. And so this bottom one here, um, and I see the one at the top. Like so, from what I read on your website, the inside was an actual video. Right. Well, let me explain these. The live action. This is all called production value, and the reason why we I. I we got an Emmy for the top one is because majority of the movie was all matte paintings because it was, it was a low budget it's a TV show. So the, the area in orange, that's all live action. And we kind of cut that into the painting. And so uh, this, this was on for several seconds. Now the one below uh, I kept this because of, because the director wanted the foreground to be darker. So the final, and, and, and this is what happens um, when you're working with a group of people, there's, there's, a, if the director wants something darker, this was, this was my vision of, uh, of, uh, what's called the Eden cave, but it wasn't the, the director's vision. He, he envisioned something a lot darker. So, so what you saw on the screen doesn't look like this. Right. So right. I, so, I've so I was, put it up. Yeah, so I was really. This was like my first or second year there. So I still, my ego, my ego was still involved. It's like, oh my god, these guys are missing an opportunity. This is great work, right? Well, it doesn't work that way 
uh, when you're working with a group of individuals. If they, if they have a certain idea of what they want it to look like, well, that's what you're going to have to do. And right, right. So this, and that is that is the thing when you work um, commercially as an artist, right. a boss, and yeah. their vision is what you're painting. Right. And so, well, let's take a look at the video. So everybody look at the bottom of the screen, look at this image, look at the cave painting. And then I'm going to share the screen here and we're gonna, we're going to uh, play this video. You did all this in a day? The matrix formed in a day. The life forms grew later at a substantially accelerated rate. Jim, this is incredible. Have you ever seen the light? Can I cook or can't I? So, but that shows how a matte painting is done in, right. in the video. So they basically right. cut to it and they do it. Now, sometimes it's the full screen, the painting, and other times it's just like a section of the screen, like with the Star Wars one, right. where the video is playing and you paint around it. So the question that I have for the viewers, um, how exactly do you take film footage and paint around it. You're painting on, I know, on a piece of glass, but how do you line up the shot so that it lines up perfectly with the video that, that was shot from potentially months ago? Oh, you're asking for some trade secrets here, Tim. Yes, I am. I no, am. I signed, I, I signed all these non-disclosures, man. <laughs> yeah, do they even do this anymore? I don't know. If Actually, really what you do, okay. Um, most movies are, especially if they're a special effects movie, mm -hmm. they're storyboarded. Okay? okay, so so when they, when you shoot when they shoot all the live action, it's already been storyboarded. So it uh, nobody's really shooting from the hip, and so the map painting has already been kind of pre decided so that when they're when they're shooting the live action, the the uh, a map painter will go literally on location, and he will direct the shot that's going to go in the map painting because usually the directors the director has no idea what we do so we uh, the, the the map department steps in like a director and goes okay we're going to need this here we're going to need that there don't have a live action cutting going into the scene because see they're part of a puzzle so if somebody's walking through a scene they're once they walk once they walk into the painting they're going to disappear right you know what i'm saying because this is not digital. It, it's live action with the painting. And the, and, uh, and the painting actually has a hole. Just imagine a hole in it. And that's where the projection is going to be. So if anything's moving out of the hole, it's, it's going to disappear because it's we can't put it into the painting. Right. Okay? So you painted the painting before they shoot the scene? No, we, shoot, we do the painting after the scene. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's, a, it, it's, a, it's a little technical. All to say, there was a scene that I did for a Jedi, and it, and it's um, it's it's where Luke Skywalker is on a skiff, and and uh, Princess Leia is being taken captive uh, on another skiff, and there's Jabba's barge, and Luke has to jump from one skiff to the other. Well, Lando Calrissian, well, see, we didn't have anybody there on location, as I remember. We may have, but I don't think so. And so. Uh, Lando Calrissian, the actor, was moving around. Well, I couldn't, I couldn't put him in the shot because the skiff was actually on pylons. So we had to paint all that out and make it look like it's levitating, right? Right. And so, but he was hanging on. So for that, for that scene, I actually had to paint Lando Calrissian hanging on, and it's a painting. And he's, and, and hopefully, and I think it was successful. Your eye is looking at. Han Solo jumping from his skiff to the other, so, and, and of course he's dodging all the, you know, the the darts and and, and, and right. all the lasers. So you're yeah. not looking. You're not looking. It's it's like magic, right? Oh, but yeah. Lando Somebody's having, actually, uh, it's just a painting of a man hanging. Correct. In that scene. Yeah. Wow. That's but again, it's where the where the action is being directed. You're you're not looking at 
at at uh, Orlando. What's it, Calrissian? You're looking at the action, right? So, how did they splice the 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 um, the paintings that you do? How did they splice that with the film? Did they reshoot it? I mean, this is before a uh, computer. Well, there's things, well, so. there's several techniques. Now, this is old school. They don't do this anymore. Some people are actually. There are some groups that are going back to to old school. Which oh is, wow. Which is fine. It's kind of like now the millennials love record players. See, I hate record mm -hmm. players. I right. always hated. <laughs> I always hated the skipping, and mm -hmm. and that's. I, I'm never going to go back to record player. But my son wanted to get me a record player. I went uh, uh, save the money. I'm, yeah, uh, my, my daughter, my youngest daughter, when she was 16, begged us, and I mean begged us for a record player. And she came home. She came home. She went to the to the to the uh, to the to the store, and she came back all excited. She bought a Sean Cassidy album there you and go she, and my Ooh. wife likes sean cassidy and, and my wife my wife her stepmother saw that sean cassidy album and lost her mind yeah. because she had that album when she was 16 yeah, <laughs> you know? that's, a, that's a partridge family right i i don't know it was but you yeah, know, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah yeah i think so i'm an 80s child she was a, you know she was a 70s yeah. child but she yeah my uh, my wife's a little older than me, but it was like, yeah, she saw that Sean Cassidy album and she flipped out. She was like, oh my god, Sean Cassidy! And my my daughter Gabby's like, you know who this is? <laughs> yeah, it, it's interesting how that life cycle works. But it does. Uh, there's all these different techniques. Well, uh, there's rear projection, front projection, and latent image. Okay, and they're kind of a little. I don't know. We'll probably lose your your your, uh, your listeners here, but they're, it's it's somewhat technical. I'll explain latent. In latent, you create uh, the you're shooting a live action, and you block out an area uh, with black on in front of the camera. So the camera's open. So there's just a window where the camera's going to film the live action, and everything around it is black. It's got to be very black. And so let's say there's just somebody walking down a road, and once that action is filmed, then the film is wound back into the camera, like 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 from the very start, and now a painting is done of that scene. So maybe he's walking down a road in London, Abbey Road, and with trees and whatever. And now the area where the live action uh, has been filmed is blacked out. That way, it's not overexposed. And now the the film is exposed to the painting. And so there's a certain amount of run-up that kind of like when you and I talked before we started this, there's like a run-up where you you make all your mistakes, make sure your colors are matched up, make sure your perspective is matched up. Right. And then once you get to the, the real live action, that's where you separate the professionals from the amateurs because now if you screw up, you've just wasted all that film. So it's there like is, exposure. Yeah, it's a, it's a double exposure. Okay. Yeah, okay. thank you. Yeah, it's it's a double exposure, but yeah. uh, okay. but certain errors have to be black, uh, matted matted out so that you don't uh, uh, double expose something into the live action. You know, you, right. you don't want to see any any kind of dust. That's why it's got to be perfectly black. Right. Uh, it's got to lack light. You want right. to eliminate so all to be a matte painting. That's right. You use a mat to keep those areas from getting exposed in the film. Boy, that, that is, right. you know, yeah. you know, sometimes when you go back in time, the way that problems were solved to create a special effect, it's pretty much in a lot of ways, way more innovative and harder to do than what right. they do now with computers. Yeah. Well, I'm sure when somebody came up with the double exposure it was a mistake. They forgot, they forgot that uh, they'd already taken a picture. They rewound it expose it again and they saw these two images and they went wow and so some of the first uh let's say uh double exposures were where they blocked off one part of the film and you had an actor you know looking that way and then he got on the other side of the film uh, other side of the camera and and the, the and the, the previous shot was blacked out and he's talking to himself and then right. Right, and those then, movies where they were like your evil twin and stuff. Yeah, exactly. So when they play it back, the set is the same, but they're both talking to each other. Now, what right. has to what has to be consistent is the lighting. If you do it inside of a set, the light's consistent. But if you did it under, let's say, natural light, 
then the light would change. The shadows would change. You see? Oh, wow. Right, right, right. So is- some, something would be off. So, uh, so it, there's all these technical things that have to be considered. That's why when we went out on location, it was best to have somebody from the math department because the director's not thinking of these things, right? He, all right. he's thinking about is narrative, the actors, the action. He, he doesn't want to be uh, consumed with uh, map paintings and somebody moving out of frame or this frame or time of day. He, he doesn't care. So that was our job. So originally you had all these young 20 year olds that got bullied at first. And, and then we insisted, no, we want to be there on the shot. We, we want to tell the director what we need. And that was kind of fun, actually, because it was like being a director for a shot. It's like, okay, where are we going to set up? Uh, okay, put the camera here. And then you're just kind of – the director's directing, but you're directing the shot. All right. That's pretty wild. I mean, that, that that is such an amazing thing. You know, nowadays – and we were talking about this uh, earlier, how when you watch a movie nowadays and it says special effects, and you see thousands and thousands and right. thousands of names scrolling across the screen. But if we were to go – Wrath of Khan, there'd be 30 of you, maybe, maybe yeah. less, you know? Yeah, there's and, only, and there's only about 50 to 60 uh, employees. It was a very small company, really. Right. And that and that covers everything from painting an actual model of the Death Star to painting a matte scene. Yeah. When I worked jumping over Job of the Hut's boat. <laughs> yeah, Tim, when I worked on Jedi, there were only three of us painting. We did 45 paintings and That's we had and unbelievable. we had two cameramen. Not wild. Yeah. It was yeah. wild, and it was yeah. fun. It was fun, and and and, and we had our own uh, department room. We had our music cranked up loud, and um, there was great camaraderie for the most part. Just after a while, you get on, you know, when you see the same guys over and yeah. over, you get on each other's nerves. But right. it was fun. I, I look at it now. It was it was very formative, and I had two other artists that I worked with. Michael Pigrazio and Christopher Ep- Evans were, are just amazing artists. So I learned a lot from, from both of them. And uh, it's very formative. And especially to be around uh, somebody like George Lucas, because you, uh, you're, uh, it was just considered essential, imperative, and just uh, part of why you were being hired to be the, to give the best product and, and just the best effort for the movie. So there was a lot of pressure, but it was good pressure. It was good stress, right? Right. Yeah. You know, it's like I always, I have a, a couple models that I live by as an artist, but one of them is if I'm the best artist in the room, I'm in the wrong room. I need to go find a room where I'm the least skilled artist so I can grow yeah. so I can learn. And, you know, the Bible talks about iron sharpens iron, so a friend makes a friend better. You know, yeah. when you're in an environment like that where excellence is 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 not just expected, it's encouraged, and you're yeah. around all these other amazing talents, it just makes you want to step up your game. Yeah, well, you have to. I, I mean, yeah. the, 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 artists that I, the artists I work with were phenomenal. And and, and, and frankly, you know, for every walk of life, here's, uh, I, whether you're a guitarist, where you, if you own a restaurant, what, uh, building cars, Competition is is actually a healthy thing, right? I and, and as you and as you say, if you're if you're just the that best person in the room, you're never going to grow. You know, you're going to be surrounded by sycophants, right? People yeah. just say, "Oh, you're you're great, Tim." It's like a, fa- a Facebook post, right? It's amazing, and you look at the work, and and eh, it's okay, but it's not amazing. Right. It's not the type right. of what I would call amazing. I, I hope that doesn't come off as being braggadocious, but, but when you're when you're around. Artists of such a high caliber, then your definition of amazing is really, really high. Right. right? Yeah. And that, you know, and that, and that's a great point. That's why I like uh, organizations, art organizations like Portrait Society, Plein Air Society. You're around artists of those, and you're and you're competing in art shows with them, and you're right. And, and it basically, you look around and you're like, if you're, yeah. If you put, if I put something on Facebook, I guarantee all my friends from high school and all my family are gonna be, oh Tim, that's the greatest painting in the world, and oh my gosh, you're so talented. But mm-hmm. you know, uh, one of my friends would be like, hey Tim, would you like a critique on that? <laughs> you know, and they'd yeah. probably tear it to shreds. I'd rather have someone that can talk to me and 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 tear a painting to shreds and make me better than have right. all 
hundred people telling me how great I am. I mean, nobody right. needs that, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah, that, want, that, go ahead. Yeah, you want constructive criticism, and, and, uh, uh, criticism from somebody who is a master at his craft and, yeah. you know, and have a teachable spirit. Because if you're not teachable, I mean, I have I have friends come in and uh, who are really good. Like I said, these guys from Disney, and they've got a good eye. And go, why did you do that? What do you think about doing this or that? Now, if I'm a, if I'm already thinking or seeing that something is it, it could be better, I mean, I'll really listen. And 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 right. it's really and it's really helped me. And and that's always really good. And there, and sometimes it's just taste. Now, why did you put that tree there? Well, that's part of of uh, you know. Part of the narrative, the tree of life. So let's say I was doing a painting of a tree of life. So why is the tree right. there? Well, there has to be a tree because that's the painting, right? Painting is so, tree. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> uh, there is that element of personal taste. And so, uh, but you have to have done enough painting or grow as an individual and as a person mm -hmm. to, to, to kind of detach yourself enough so that your ego is not involved. And and but, that and but that you're also uh, uh, willing to hear a, a critique. You know? Yes, you know I, I think that I think that, and it's anywhere in life, um, any aspect of life, you need to have a mentor. You need to have someone that. Oh, I had several. Yeah. yeah, you need to have people in your life that you've given them permission to speak into your life. And to tell you the things that might even be painful to hear, but you know yeah. they're going to tell you the truth and they're going to tell it to you in yeah. love. Those are people that really love you. Good point, yeah. Tim. Because Absolutely. because the truth hurts sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. You know, I, I've and had some art, artist so friends. The truth. Go ahead. Go ahead. You know, I just think that that what you just said. It's that is truly loving somebody if you're willing to tell them the hard truths. You know, I I remember telling my kids when they were growing up. You know, the truth is the truth, and sometimes the truth hurts. Yep. But it's the truth. The truth doesn't change. The truth right. is always that rock, right. and you know we can run around that rock and dance around it, but eventually you're going to trip over that rock if you don't stand on it. Yeah. So, the truth is important, and if if you don't have people in your life that are loving you enough to tell you those hard truths. You're never going to get anywhere in life. You're just not. So, yeah. on the other hand, on the other hand, it's good to have a wife that loves that loves your work. Because my, every, I don't think I've ever done a painting my wife doesn't like. Oh, that is beautiful. I, 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 I think it's okay. Oh, it's, I just love it. So there uh, you go. I hope she, hopefully she's not she's not gonna listen to this because you know I don't always go for her for critiques. But there are, there are times where she'll go. Oh, there's something that's See, but see, she does have a good eye in this respect. She'll look at it and she'll go, I don't know what it is, but I, I can't tell you, but there's something not right. Right. You know, when you're not married yeah. to an artist. Right. They you know, can't. My, my wife, her background is, is ballet instruction, you know, and, okay. and, and now she works as a, uh, she works for a, a Navy defense contractor, you know. Okay. Uh, She's not an artist, um, but she knows she can look at something. And just like you said, she, she can't tell me exactly what it is. Right. But she'll know something's not right. Right. And she'll she'll let me know. You know, she lets me know. And it's kind of funny. We always joke. It's like um, we just did a painting together. She likes to do those paint pours. As a, She's more crafty. And so she she did a paint pour and she did. She's been doing pretty good at that. And so we she did a paint pour and it looked like ocean water and these things. And so she asked me to paint some fish over it. So I painted some fish over it. That is the first painting in our house that I've actually painted. <laughs> there's no art of mine. If you go into my house, there's no art in mine other than that fish painting that we did together. Okay. Yeah. Is there a reason for that? You just don't like looking at your art or what? I, no, it's, it's, it's kind of funny. It's just like, well, because I paint biblical narrative paintings and a lot of my exhibit work it's like most people wouldn't hang that. It's like, cause we live on the beach. So she wants, okay. you know, like, like the painting we did together, it's like an abstract paint pour with pompano fish. Okay. That's what we want. Turtles, sand, seashells. Yeah. It's all, it's a beach house, you know, <laughs> we, we, want, we want all that stuff. And so that, that's kind of thing. So, so having a painting of, you know, like Moses parting the Red Sea, not something she's going to want to hang in the wall. Hey, in the house. hey. Yeah, I put Moses on a surfboard riding that 
right in that Give red sea. My, uh, my friend Rob Woodrum, he's a pastor of a church here in town, but he's also a phenomenal painter. And he made a comic book called uh, Rabbi Encounters, which is like, it's about if Jesus came today. So instead of Roman soldiers, it's like UN troops. Yeah. And like the woman in the well, it's the woman in the laundromat. Okay. You know, things like that. It's, like it's one it. of the great graphic novels I have ever read. It's really that good. You should check it out. But um, he's also an avid surfer. And he did. He has a very great painting that he did. And it's Jesus walking on water, but he's surfing. There you go. Like leaning like this. Yeah. Feet, and he's going down the wave like he's surfing or this, 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 this just this glorious wave. But yeah. it's walking Oh, on you got to have fun with art. You got to have fun with art. And, and it's, you know. Yeah, it's See, I loved, <laughs> yeah, I kind of planned my life where I, I, I wanted to do the special effects work. I wanted to work for Lucasfilm, but I also wanted to work on book covers. But I also wanted to have my own gallery. So the Lord has blessed me with having fulfilled those dreams, right? Working on, uh, and I, you know, I also did a project for the White House where I did a, a poster for uh, you know, the Easter egg roll. So I've had all these fun, fun uh Parts of my life where, where I never thought that th these things would happen. And I, I like the stage of my life having a gallery on the street where somebody could just walk in. And here, and, and this kind of ties in with what we were just talking about, where somebody would go, I really like, I, I like that painting. And so I'll ask them, and before I used to say, well, thank you. Now I ask them, what do you like about it? And then they'll tell me, well, I like the way that you capture light, or I really feel that you're, I hear this a lot. I hear that your, your, your landscapes are very spiritual. I don't, I don't know what it is about your landscapes, but I, I felt, I, I sense they're very spiritual. And of course, I think as a Christian, it just kind of comes out of you, right? You right. Just, I, I, the light to me is very important. And to evoke this sense of God's creation is, that's part of who I am. So people sense that and, and they're, and they're trying to verbalize what it is that they're seeing. Well, I have found that to be a very useful tool. And then other times, it's like, I'll ask them, why'd you like that? So, well, I like horses. And you have a horse in there. So you'll get that response, right. which, is, which is good because you thought, well, maybe they liked it because of the sunset. No, because I like it. There's a horse. Right. You know, and, and one thing that I've People learned over the years, uh, and again, I'm quoting my, 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 my buddy Matt here, but he talks about nobody buys art because they want it they, they, or they need it or it's not even about the price point. People buy art because of connection. Exactly right. They connect. Sometimes it is a price point though. <laughs> yeah, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> sometimes they're like, whoa, sticker shock, you know? Yeah. But when people buy art, it's it, they want a piece of the artist. There's some, they connect with you in, in a way and that, that, that artwork, it's you, the artwork and them. And there's something about the artwork, that piece of art. Right. Gives them a little bit of you and a little bit of them and you and and you connect through that art right. and that's what people are really purchasing that's what they want exactly that's i couldn't agree, i couldn't agree with you more i just sold a painting of um let's see here uh, vernal falls in yosemite and the person that bought it it's a big painting he uh his boys are all grown up but they had gone to yosemite for 15 years straight with other families and so they had, if you've ever been to Yosemite, there's this, you know, concrete walk all the way up to the top of Vernal Falls. And, and you, you just get wet because the mist is everywhere. And the, the, the painting is called The Thunderous Roar of Mist. And there's mist everywhere. And there's this white water of, 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 of the, of the, of the river as it crashes on these rocks. And he just said, man, that that's, that's what it was like when I was there with my kids. And he has it in his home now. And he had just a profound connection to that painting, but more so it reminded him of his boys, the time that they had spent there, seeing them grow in those 15 years. And right. there's something very, I tell people in, in, in many ways, if you look at the book of Exodus, God, after God created a miracle or something profound happened to the children of Israel, he had them, and I'm no way saying this is like God, but right. he had to build a little monument so they could remember, right? Right. They would build a memorial. Yeah. A memorial. 
And, and if you read the Psalms, it's all about remembering. Remember what God had, has done for you. Right. Remem remember how God parted the Red Sea. Remember how you were once slaves, but now you're free. And the paintings can be that. You can remember this, this wonderful time. Because right. especially now right. during during these very difficult trying, uh, during the apocalypse and the plague, you know what Paul was. Uh, Paul was in jail, and and my favorite verse is "Be anxious for nothing," right? And he goes, and you know, he goes on, goes on, you know, and that, and, and I'm having a senior moment right now, and I usually know that passage word for word, but I'm blanking on it. But here's the thing: after that, he goes, "Whatever is good, whatever is lovely, whatever is you know, a virtuous, a good report, meditate on those things." Right, and there's something very powerful about looking at something that you can remember the good times because people are getting depressed right now. People are kind of um, at their wits' end. I talk to them. I talk to some people who are very fearful, and you have to remember the good times. You have to remember that it's not always going to be uh, bad, for lack of, of, of another term. I mean, even now as an artist, there's some days where. I'm just, I just don't have it. I just feel like breaking, you know, the brush stick and just, ah, oh, just, but I've done this enough to know that, you know, it's going to be better tomorrow. Tomorrow right. I, I'll have a better attitude. I don't know if it, I, if it was bad steak or what, and it is. You know, and that's the thing. And, it is. It's like there, there, there's a thing going over around the internet and it says, you know, was it a bad day or was it a bad five minutes that you're letting ruin your whole day? It's a good meme. It's you know? true. And and that's one of the things. And, and I I we I always sing a little song from, um, you know, remember the old Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer yeah. uh, show. There, there was a little song. She said, "It's always tomorrow. There's always tomorrow for dreams yeah. to come true." Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like whenever you're having a bad day, it's like, "Hey, there's always tomorrow." Yeah. You know, yeah. it's going to be better. The sun's going to come up tomorrow, and things yeah. are going to you, you get yeah. a reset. So yeah, you know, try again. Yeah. And, and you know, Tim, and I've been doing this a long time, so there's a, there's a certain type, a certain level of professionalism where I'll still do something, even if I know, yeah, I don't have it today. I'm distracted about something, thinking about whatever, and I'll try to do something else. I'll try to prepare some panels, just so some panels or, or, or whatever, or, or do a little busy work, or maybe I'll work on something that doesn't require a lot of attention. I'm, I might work on a sky because I could just get a lot of paint on there and then it might relax me and music's also very important you know and so having just uh, the right music to put me in the right mood and right yeah what you're talking about is you know the difference between a professional and a hobbyist you know um yep. i heard it said um you know you can't expect professional results if you have hobbyist habits there you go. Oh, so you're just full of all these great little aphorisms. I, I, know a lot. I listen to a lot of different people talking about a lot of different things, but that's, <laughs> that, that's a good one. That's one of the yeah. best ones I've heard, honestly. And it's definitely, I wish it was mine, but it's not. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's true, though. You know, it's like people, it's like, what's the difference between a professional artist and a hobbyist artist? A professional artist treats it like a job. They wake up, they do the work, and they, and they keep going. They don't wait for inspiration from on high to hit them right. before paint you know yeah. and they're, they're, they go weeks without painting anything no no a professional is in the studio every day working on their craft taking right. classes watching videos practicing and training and you know things like, like one of the things that i i've been in the habit of doing is every six months i paint color wheels oh. like really tough intense because color theory is one of my favorite things to, yeah. to do and so i will stop everything for for two to three days and I will do nothing but work on a very intense color wheel. I'm <laughs> impressed. <laughs> but I do it every six months as, as just it's a habit of mine. And it, boy, it, as it helps, you know, I just love it. But that's a, for me, that's a professional practice of sharpening my knives, you know, because I teach, I teach uh, chiaroscuro, I teach, you know, basic drawing things. So I'm always working on those skills. But color theory is not something I get to teach very often, but mm -hmm. it's, it's something that's a passion of mine. So I want to mm -hmm. keep that to keep that knife sharp and so nothing will do that better than going back to the basics and, and painting the basic things but that's a professional practice that i do to keep it keep it from keep those things sharp but i want to show some of your artwork because you transitioned from working for industrial light and magic you did you worked on children's books and other yep. things as a commercial artist but not then you transitioned to 
uh, full-time fine artists doing portraitures, landscapes, uh, still lifes, everything. I want to show some of your artwork. Talk to us about when you decided to make the make the switch and, and how you made the switch. And I'm going to put some of your artwork up here so people can see. Let's put this one up here. This is a gorgeous painting. And this one is called Job. Yep. Yep. This was uh, actually my, uh, God, I did that probably about 12 years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's an old painting. Uh, I don't necessarily paint in that style as much anymore. Uh, but he, he, he was my FedEx guy and I've actually used them for a lot of paintings. And, <laughs> uh, a, 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 a wonderful Christian man, his name's Paul. And so I, you, he was posing for an illustration, but I liked the look so much that I said, "Hey, can um, can you post? Uh, can you post for uh, something else? Just uh, I'm gonna do it for myself." And, and that's and that was this painting. And um, he just has a wonderful spirit, and we would have all these great uh, talks about God and just just our, our walks with the Lord. And uh, you know, when you find somebody who um, as a model that somehow has has the spirit that you're trying to communicate, man, that's that is that is gold. And so I've used him for angels, I've used him for guards. In fact, uh, I've used him for Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. I've used him for a lot of things. Oh wow, was, that's great. That's he, what that's what an artist would call a muse. Yes, he's a great guy. And and so I've given him several of my paintings as thank yous and uh, he's a That's really good guy so let's look at this other one this is a this one's actually behind you um this yep. is one of your more recent pieces i take yep i went over to uh nemo texas and they had all these um cowboy and native reenactors and um i actually i actually painted this during the uh during the lockdown and i was just on facebook and I was just showing people my techniques, and so this this was uh, a result of uh, uh, kind of a step by step. This is how Frank Rodas paints, and um, this character just seemed sad to me. There was something uh, ab about him that I wanted to draw out, and uh, I, there 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 is a he's native, but if you look in those eyes. There's just there's a lot of pain. I see a lot of pain there, and mm. I don't know why. As an artist, you go, "Why am I painting this?" And there's just something that um, I just want something to express. I want to, I want to express. You know. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I think I think that's a good point. You know, it's like sometimes as artists, especially if you do portrait work, portrait uh -huh. work. You know, you're like, you see somebody and the light hits them just right, or they've got a facial expression. Yeah. You're like, I have to paint that. I have yeah. to paint, you know, you I know have because, to paint that. Cause I have it, to yeah, because Tim, if you live life and we've gone through so many emotions, we have, we have a, a, a son and he has a disability. And I have another son who's just, just, you know, a uh, varsity runner in high school and just, you know, Mr. Uh, Mr. Popular. So we, we, we've experienced so much with these two children and a lot of that will come into my art, you know, all the highs and the lows, the, the, the happiness, the sorrows, the disappointments. I mean, you get that when you read Job, you get that when you read the Psalms. Right. And so, uh, I, I think it's a glorious thing, and, and, uh, and especially uh, songwriters experience that, right? Dylan, right. Be, Dylan being one of the best of, of just ex expressing his thoughts of, of, of life and relationship. And so um, I, try to, I try to put that into my art. And, and for better or for worse, I'm not thinking, you know, is this painting going to sell? Well, I probably should think about that more often. I'm just, I'm just taken, I'm, I'm taken by something. And I want to, I want to express it. And you want to express it in pain. And I think, you know, yeah. I think that, that that's a good thing. I think when an artist, you know, if, if you're looking at, I mean, you have to make a living at it, obviously. But I think when we put the focus on, I got to make a painting to sell, as opposed to painting what is on your heart. I think if you paint what's on your heart, yeah. 
people will connect with that and the painting will sell. Whereas if you're just trying to find, if you're just trying to paint something to sell, you'll be painting the latest craze or the latest fad and you're constantly having to change. Yeah. Or, you know? or, or, or you're just kind of doing what like Thomas Kincaid did, just variations of what your marketing team tells you what to you paint. paint. Hey, right. okay, we got we got to paint, you know, giant Rocky Mountains in the background, kind of a, a prairie house. With right. The, with the golden glow coming out of the window, smoke coming right. out. Right. There's no experimentation. There's no, yeah. It's, yeah. You know, these are what sells. Yeah. So paint those yeah. things. Only. This is, this is, we, this was our big seller. Go ahead and paint that. But paint we, some more of that. Yeah. Paint some more of that. I actually know a painter that his, um, he, he, he does a lot of licensing work and, um, his, um, his artwork is, um, the colors that he picks is, um, his wife would go to the fashion shows and find out what the colors are for next year. Like what are going to be the hot colors that year? And then he yeah. paint his palette for that year would be those colors. Yep. Yeah. I, I, I worked for a card company uh, after I left Lucasfilm They're called portal publications. And they would kind of tell you that, okay, these colors are hot right now. And this is, it's our, our or they'll go cows are hot. So we're going to do some, do you remember for a while there, everybody was just cards. Everything had cows or had pigs or we're going to do flamingos. Flamingos are big or right. it's, it's zebras. Z right. Everything's zebra or cats. And right. so there's, there's these fads that come, <laughs> come and go, and come and go. And they can come back again, but they'll come back with a different variation. But there are these stylist influencers that are in the media and they're trying to get you. It's you know, get that information. So in a sense, they're in, they're uh, they're hypnotizing you to 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 and convince you that this is this is what's popular right now. And if you want to be popular, this is what you should. This is what you, this is what you do. You know, I worked in the paint do. party industry for about nine years, and paint parties were they were the big rage for about ten years. And, you know, I mean, that would be, you know, that's the thing where you have the, you know, it's like a girl's night out and there's an artist on the stage with a painting and okay. a blank canvas. And then you're sitting there with a blank canvas and a, and a little paint tray with paint and you've got your friends there and there's wine and food and, All right. and, and the yeah. artist, okay, draw a circle in red and then draw a line in blue yeah. and get your paint in the green and go, and you go home with this beautiful painting and you're like, wow, I did that, you know, but it is was that like, still going on. Is oh, it it, 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 it's the fat is kind of waning a little bit. Okay. But, um, back in the day, I say back in the day, you know, about maybe six years ago, I would have, it was six days a week and a small class was 65. The biggest <sighs> class I had was 111 people in the class. Yeah. I, I bet and, you couples were into it, right? Oh yeah. There were date night. We did special date night paintings where it was two paintings that would combine into one. So he uh -huh. would paint this side, she would paint the other. They would connect together, make one big painting. Yep. It, it was the biggest, hottest thing ever going. But you got 30 paintings a month. Yeah. And so it was a constant, like one year chickens, roosters were the thing. And if we, knew, right. if we did a rooster painting, we'd have 100 people in a class. And then it was, uh, it was farmhouses. And then right. it was uh, variations of the starry night. Like we have a bridge here in Panama City. It's called the Hathaway Bridge. You do the Hathaway Bridge, but it's a starry night there style. Pack the place out, you know, but it was a constant what's hot, what's hot, what's hot, right. you know? Right. And so it was like, it was. So you're always following, you're always following the trend. You're, you're always the trend. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're chasing the, you're chasing trends to make money. And, and it got to be, it could be very stressful if you weren't careful with it, you know? So yeah. it's always neat to see how artists figure out what are they going to paint? What are they not going to paint? And then how do they, how do you find that this is what I love to paint and this is how I'm going to make a living painting. Yeah. Yeah. And finding the way to do that is not always easy. You know, my business model for the stuff that I paint for my studio work is very different. Like I do a lot of, I do a lot of pet portraits and that is sometimes my base. That's uh -huh. where I make the bulk of my, my money is with pet portraits, but my studio work, it's like, okay, how do I make a, a cause most people wouldn't buy a painting of say a, a biblical narrative with, with text in it to hang on their wall. Oh, you'd be surprised. Yeah. And, and I know in your, in your situation, cause you, you paint a lot, a lot of those, but 
I found a way to, to show my work and exhibit my work and sell that works differently than being in galleries and selling yeah. paintings, things like that. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there are people out there um, that do phenomenal in, in that field, but I've, I've used a slightly different business model to sell my art. And it's always interesting to see, okay, how does the artist paint what they want and then figure out how to make money at it, you know? Yeah. But uh, now let me show what your last painting because you just talked about how, you know, hey, you sell biblical art all the time. So you've got one of my favorite stories in the Bible. And so I'm going to show this painting off. This is uh, this is uh, Belshazzar with Daniel and the handwriting on the wall. Um, one of the things I love about this uh, about this um, this story in the Bible is that Daniel in the book of Daniel, his name was changed from Daniel to a Babylonian name, which was Belteshazzar which means keeper of the treasures of Baal. Okay. Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, who is the king at this time, his name is Belshazzar, which means the treasure of Baal. Okay. And so the, the connotation is, is that he was named Baal's treasure because they were expecting Daniel to watch over him his whole life. Okay. And then you see what happens in this story that he he does a horribly dumb thing and then he ends up, you know, getting killed and, and all of that in the story. But this was an amazing story. But um, I love this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible that you painted. So um, what draws you to paint biblical narratives like this? Well, this this was actually an illustration done for Lifeway. OK, uh, I used to do a lot of work for Lifeway mm -hmm. until the until the art director. Uh, retired and then usually when they bring in a, another art director they have their own artists so that was the last time uh, I worked for them but uh, I used to do a, uh, just a lot of biblical scenes for Lifeway and in fact uh, this is my FedEx guy There's, he's uh, three of the characters there and my wife is is the woman there reclining on on those on those pillows and uh, this was the writing on the wall and I just wanted something uh, dramatic and uh, probably put, put in way too much work for what they were paying me. But I just loved the scene. And I look at it now and I go, oh, I could do this or I could do that. And most of these are painted uh, under, you know, they want it yesterday. So you have two to three weeks to paint. So, uh, so I have like a week to get the models, to have a sketch. And then another a couple of weeks to put it all together and 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 paint it. So now is this always, or oil? It's an oil. Okay. Now, I almost you know exclusively work in oil now, although I do do some pastel. You know. Amazing. So you had to knock these things out. So how do you how do you how do you get them dry enough and fast enough to ship them over there when they're when they're oils? Oh, I, I use I use liquid, and. Okay. Um, so hopefully they'll dry real quick. Hey, this, there's uh, my studio. I have all these uh, windows. And so the light has changed. So you notice um, it's getting darker here. I can see that. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. We can still see. But, um, you know, we are we are getting close to the end of the broadcast here. So, um, uh, Frank, I cannot thank you enough. I definitely want to have you back on. We got so much more to talk about. Oh, we just scratched the surface. We really did. We really did. But I want to say thank you for coming on the show. And uh, I'll, I'll stay on the line real quick. I'm going to say goodbye to the audience, and then I'll come back and talk to you a little bit. Okay. Thank you. Wow, guys, that was a good show. I told you it was a good show. So much knowledge. Oh, my gosh. Let me tell you what. That's what we do at the Modern Masters Podcast. Uh, if you want to learn more about Frank Ordaz, check out his website. It is ordazart.com, and uh, you can learn about his art. You can see all uh, just a ton of his paintings are on there. Uh, he's got an absolutely great website. Um, and uh, before we go, as always, guys, remember um, – whoops, there we go. I know what I'm doing. Almost know what I'm doing. There we go. That's me, Tim Gagno. And right there in the bottom of the screen, uh, remember, like this page uh, uh, on Facebook, Gagno Atelier Facebook page. And if you can, go over to our YouTube channel and hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. I would greatly appreciate that. And remember, guys, as always, remember one thing. 
God loves you, and so does your old pal Tim. We'll talk to you next time.